Sir, awesome. I had problems with my connection last week. I really need to make this wired. <clears throat> there are both of these. Yeah, that's, those are HDMI. Um, there's one cable coming up here. <clears throat> I could probably wire one this one. Yeah, that's okay. Don't worry about it for now. No, uh, this is not permanent, so we won't, this won't permanently be here. Yeah, 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank well, what I'm looking for is a good enough. Because high quality will destroy our internet like some different at our current level. Besides that, it takes a lot of CPU power to our quality of the computer compression. And the compressor is the four part of the power. So this is like a medium quality, you know, and it's, this is a, a hyper-threaded quad core. So it's got eight, eight CPUs in it for virtual core physical. And it, it's using a quarter of the power. Right? So it's two CPUs to do this one quality. If you want to do high quality, it would max out all the things. But I mean, this isn't an up and eight chip. This is a... Uh, uh, the first person of uh, I7 that you can uh, probably from around that time. You know, the Haswell process is the latest one for the version. So this is first. It's only running at one point next to the bigger one. So you know, we definitely can do a lot better. You know, with technology, things like live streaming are possible. Well, it always was. Yes, and you know, just five years ago, the do what we're doing cost you five million dollars. Thank <laughs> you. 
Matt, let's go ahead and pray and we'll let you be seated. Lord, we thank you for the time. And again, we're thankful for the opportunity to sing praise to you. I pray that you'll help us to enjoy our service. And I pray that you'll help us to benefit from it through the fellowship of other believers and through your word. I pray that we would be encouraged and strengthened to serve you more faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And for our Bible reading this morning, let me ask you to turn to Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3, and we'll give you a minute to find that. Um, in the Old Testament, if you find Ezekiel or Daniel, you've gone just a little bit too far. And so Lamentations chapter 3. And we'll begin reading in verse 19 and read through verse 25. Mr. Johnny's going to come read that for us. Lamentations 3, verses 19 through 25. Remembering my afflictions and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind that is my hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his past compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
Team next Sunday, we're going to have a teen service at, or a teen afterglow after the evening service to come prepare for that after the evening service next Sunday. And as well, just a quick cool thing that I've been working on the website. On the team page, we've been um, recording all the team messages that happen on Wednesday night. So 
If a teen happens to miss on a Wednesday night or happens not to be there, they can go online and see the messages up there as well. And good help to parents if you want to know what's being preached on and be able to talk about what is going on Wednesday night. It's a great tool for you as well. And so I would just love to hear you guys utilize that. Thank you, Pastor Sands. If you have your bulletin, I do need you to look at a couple of things with us uh, this morning. Uh, in your bulletin, uh, there are a couple of things. One is just a parent update uh, that we put in there once in a while. The second one is we have a couples outing, and uh, we've had this listed on our schedule as November 1st and 2nd, and uh, we had a couple of glitches in getting some, some things set up uh, for that, and so we're going to change that. So it's going to be just a Saturday morning. Um, and, and actually, it's going to be Saturday from 9 o'clock until 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, Pastor Dave Pittman from down at Temple Baptist Church, a uh, good friend, is going to be our speaker for that. And uh, we'll actually have, we'll meet at the George Washington Hotel here in Winchester. And uh, we have a room set aside for that. And we'll meet and have a session with him. Then we have a brunch and fellowship time. And then we'll have another session and a little fellowship time and some things that are in there. And then one last session. And uh, the sessions themselves will be over at 1 o'clock. Uh, but we're planning to have child care here at the church until 3. And so if we have some folks who want to go do some things after that, uh, you can, uh, the, the sitters here will work based on tips. And so you can decide what you want to give them. Uh, but we need to get people signed up for that quickly. And so if we have to send them a, a list by the 25th, which is Friday. And so if you're able to go to that, uh, we need to know that right away. So uh, let us know if you're planning to come to that. I think you'll enjoy it, though. We have some uh, good things planned for it, and it's just a couple's uh, outing, and Lord willing, we'll expand that into uh, an over, overnight thing next week. Uh, then also, uh, there are a couple of other things, and in your bulletin, uh, we were supposed to have a business meeting last Sunday afternoon just to approve an amendment, and um, I forgot. And so uh, tonight we're going to do that. And David Channel is in charge of reminding me to do that this evening. So if we forget tonight, it's his fault. Uh, but that amendment is in there. And as I've mentioned before, it's just very simply something that the IRS needs. Not the, Actually, not the IRS. Uh, uh, they can get enough. Um, this is uh, for, it's called SEVIS. Uh, it's so that we can issue an I-20. And uh, it's just a government thing that, like I said, you don't want to know the details of it something that's obvious that we have to put in writing. Um, and then there are a couple of other things that are in there. One is there's a BJU Corral, Bobjin University Corral, that's going to be here in November. And uh, we've had these before. There are about 40 in the group, and it's a, a choir. Uh, you will enjoy hearing them sing with some of the testimonies that they have. But we do have the opportunity to house them for the night. And so we have about 40 people that we need to put in homes. And if you would be willing just to have them in your home overnight, uh, you can take two of them or, or four of them, however many you want. And let me encourage you to do this. You know, one of the things that we really lose in our society is hospitality. Um, I remember when I was uh, back in West Milford and, and uh, we had people at our church. My dad didn't get saved until I was uh, at the end of my ninth grade year. Uh, but we had people in our home regularly. Uh, we would have missionaries stay with us, and, and over and over, my mom and dad would do that. And I remember many of those. And some of them I remember fondly, and some of them I remember. Uh, but they were all good experiences for me. And I really encourage you, have people in your home. And these are college-age young people. Your home doesn't have to be fancy or immaculate. They just want to spend some time getting to know you and uh, some fellowship and just uh, you give them a place to sleep. That's all they need. And so Christy and Carol or Christy and Krissa, uh, Christy know or somebody know, and uh, we need your help in making sure we have enough housing for those folks. And the information's there in the bulletin for you. Um, Senior Saints of Perkins on, on Tuesday of this week. Uh, 5 o'clock or 5.30, I believe that is. Uh, we're having that, no, it's 5 o'clock. Uh, we'll have dinner at, St. at Perkins this week. And then uh, two other things that are not in your bulletin. So you're familiar with probably both of them. As you came in out here, there are some apples there. Uh, in Winchester, there is a group that does what's called gleaning. That is, that after they pick all the apples, they have people who go in and they pick the apples um, that are left. And uh, that's very kind of the orchards to let them do that. But they like to distribute those to people, especially who are in need. 
And so they asked our help if we could uh, uh, help with that. If you have a neighbor, friend, somebody that could use apples, would you take those and give them to them? Perhaps your family would use apples. Now, uh, those apples can't stay there because next week they will begin to smell a little different if we leave them too long. And so if your family could use some, that would be fine, but we do need to get those out of there today. And so help me out with that. When you leave today, uh, take a bag of them. If you have a neighbor, friend, family that you know could use them, uh, give those out for us and, and let's just help, um, uh, help those families out. The other thing is that we are beginning to think about summer already, and we have opportunities with some uh, young people that are coming from China, and uh, they are um, teenage young people, or let me see, they are, um, Susan, tell me the ages again. 11 through 18. 11 through 18, and we need homes for them to stay in, uh, and it will be for just about a week. Uh, but it's an opportunity we have often to do that. And again, the same thing I said about hospitality before, you will enjoy doing this. It's a week that'll interrupt your schedule, but it'll be a good interruption. It'll be good for your family. And it's a good opportunity to have young people in your home that we do not know uh, where they are spiritually. If they're coming, they know they're coming to our, our church, our school, and some of the activities that are here. And so if you're willing to help with that, talk it over with your family, and over the summer we'll get you specific information about that uh, over the next couple of weeks so we can get those families lined up and we would encourage you to be as involved in that as you possibly can. Now, a lot of announcements this morning, sorry about that. If you are, would you please take your hymnal and turn to number 369, the song Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do. And in a moment, we're going to stand, but if you are a visitor this morning, if this is the first time that you've been here, or if you've not been here for quite some time, would you remain seated for us, please? We have some ushers that are going to come, and they'll give you a visitor's card, and then they will introduce you to us, so you don't have to do any talking. But if you're visiting, we'll remain seated. The rest of us, let's stand together, please. Living for Jesus, a life that is true. Striving to please him. Thank <laughs> you. 
you loved us still even as sinners and you said Christ to die for us that we would have forgiveness of life and we could reestablish a relationship with you that we didn't even consider to be important but you loved us enough to do that Father we thank you for that gift we thank you for your continued care of us we thank you for your spirits living in us and teaching us and guiding us we thank you for your continued teaching of us through your word. We ask you to open our minds as the pastor speaks this morning and brings what you've given him to us. Help us to absorb it and to use it in our lives. Help us every day to be more like Christ. Father, we ask you to bless him, uh, Brother Sneed's church planting ministry. Uh, help him to uh, make the right contacts, guide him to the people that that you would have him speak to, uh, give him opportunities, uh, as you give us all opportunities to evangelize. But Father, give him, uh, give him fruit for his labor. We ask you, Father, to bless in uh, uh, Brother Suttles Church in Spring City, as he's with his folks, that you would give him also the things that they need to hear today. Bless this offering, Father. Let us always remember everything we have belongs to you. It's all a gift from you. You haven't required us, you have enforced us, but you have asked us to be a part of the ministry by giving back. 
So bless this offering and the use of it. In Jesus' name, amen. change in the service schedule and uh, we have signed up for something called church cast and uh, basically what it is is we can make one phone call and then that phone that service lets everybody know through either an email a text a phone number if there's a change in the service and uh, so we need to get that information from you this morning and we talked about how to do that um, do you have those joe now go ahead. Let me tell you what to do. We need one from every family. We don't necessarily have to have every person, but uh, we have several men that are going to pass these out. But every family will take one of these. Men, go ahead and, and just pass it out. It's pretty well self-explanatory. What will happen is we'll enter this in, and uh, then uh, when we, if we make a change in the service or if we want to let you know about something special that's taking place, uh, we can just make one phone call, and it will let everybody know. Uh, what's taking place. And so we're going to get these this morning rather than put them in the bulletin and try for weeks to collect them. We decided just to do it during the service and uh, that way uh, we'll have them. And I know one of the things will be uh, trying to remember your own phone number. Um, so, you know, you can take your cell phone out and play with it right now and figure out what your phone number is. All right, so I'm going to let them pass those out. They're going to play through a stanza two or two of a song. And we'll collect those. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
We've been studying different topics in Proverbs, and we have three more lessons that we'll do that are topical out of the book of Proverbs. Uh, next week, we'll look at some lessons from nature, uh, chapter 20 or chapter 30. Uh, the Proverbs are just specifically lessons that we get from natural objects, from nature. Um, the first week in November, we'll talk about God's will. Solomon actually tells us a number of things about God's will. Uh, throughout his teaching of Proverbs. And then finally, uh, the trouble with temptation. Uh, we are, are all subject to that. And uh, as we look through Proverbs, again, Solomon was very concerned that his, his children, his sons, understand how to respond when they are tempted. But Proverbs is a genre of literature that's very specific. And I've told you in some of the services, rather than doing one long service on on. Proverbs. What are Proverbs? I want to give you a few little tidbits about Proverbs themselves. And I've told you a couple of things that it's a specific genre. And so you don't read Proverbs like you need to read a narrative. It's not a story. These are short lessons that are given to us. And they're general rules uh, through a specific example. Uh, I, I've often mentioned to you that the statement like father, like son. That is a proverb. It's a short statement from a specific example. And many of the proverbs you'll see uh, are very specifically like that. And proverbs are not laws or promises. Uh, they are things that, uh, that are observations about life. And so somebody can't take this as a promise and apply it to their life. You have to be careful with that with proverbs because you'll be disappointed in God because these are observations about life. They're not promises. They're not uh, ir irrevocable laws of God. They're just observing human behavior and understanding how people normally act. And so don't make that interpretive mistake because you will be disappointed in God and you'll be the one that's actually wrong. So be careful about that. Let me give you the characteristics of Proverbs. You'll actually find that Proverbs are brief. They are secondly concrete. They are general and they have diverse applications. Now, I tell you this because when we look through Proverbs and when you read through Proverbs, a lot of times people are trying to come to this really uh, clear, specific application for it. Well, Proverbs is, is not really meant for that. 
If we think of like father, like son as a, a, a secular proverb, it is brief. It is concrete in that it deals with a very specific manner, uh, subject matter. Uh, it is something that is general at the same time. It applies to all people. And then it is something that would have diverse applications. We could say like father, like son. We could say like mother, like daughter, like pastor, like people, like boss, like employee. We could apply it in many different ways. Uh, and each person reading it might apply it in different ways. And so there will be broad application to these things. And so when you read a proverb, you're going to find that it, it has these characteristics. And generally, a proverb is going to be something that's 25 words or less. A proverb of more than 25 words usually becomes a little bulky, and it actually becomes more of a parable at that point. And so when we're looking at proverbs, we're often looking at very specific things that are general examples that have application across the board. Now, I have you in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 11 this morning. And then really we're going to focus on another passage, but you will see why we're going to read two passages this morning. And this morning we're going to read a proverb that doesn't fit what we just described. This is going to be more of a parable that we're going to find, but we're going to take the Proverbs first before we get to that. So let's look at Proverbs 6, beginning in verse 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to, to sleep or to rest, so shall thy poverty come, as one that traveleth, or as a vagabond it might be, and thy want as an armed man. All right, now, I want you to turn over to Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24, beginning in verse 30. And you're going to recognize some of what we just read in Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 24, beginning in verse 30. I went by the field of the slothful. And by the vineyard of a man void of understanding, and lo, it was all grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding the hands to rest, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. Here in this passage, he has taken some Proverbs out of chapter 6, and whoever has written this particular section, I think this was Solomon, and so I'm going to assume it was him. I actually have a, a change. You'll see in chapter 25, verse 1, these are the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. But I believe these are still Solomon's Proverbs. Solomon is taking his own words, and he's saying, I want to make an application. I want you to think through something with me. Now, I want you to look at this passage, and, and perhaps I could do this. I've got this up in a more modern way of, of translating and more modern way of looking at it. And instead of simply reading it this time, I want you to kind of listen for me. Don't even really read through in your Bible. Just listen, because what we have in this particular section is the writer is trying to give you a visual image, a visual of uh, something so that he can make an application. And in order for the application to work, you have to have in your mind's eye what he is seeing. You have to have in your the image in your mind in order to make the application. So listen for just a minute, and let me read it, and you think about this, and I'm going to try to describe it as we go through. Solomon says, I passed by the field of the slugger. And by the vineyard of the man lacking sense. Behold, it was completely overgrown with thistles. Its surface was covered with nettles. And its stone wall was broken down. When I saw, I reflected on it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, 
a little slumber, a little holding of the hands to rest. Then your poverty will come as a robber and your want like an armed man. Now, do you get the image in your mind? I need you to do that in order to get the application that he's going to make. And in order to do this, I need you to get just kind of a sense of what he is talking about here. If we were to put a subject up here, the, the, the writer, Solomon, came to the place where he said, you know, I'm, I'm on my horse or my camel or I'm in my chariot, and I'm riding down the road. And depending on which you're in, you're bouncing along. You ever ridden the camel? How many of you have ridden the camel? Much do, yeah, a couple of people. Craig's written on. Uh, uh, I'm not a good horse rider or camel rider. I, I didn't grow up around horses, so when I ride a horse, I'm like popcorn. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not one with the horse. Not at all. Now, a camel is different. When you ride a camel, he has these long legs, and, and Craig, you probably found this out, and you go, and you kind of just, because he takes these long, loping steps, and he's just kind of going along. So, so whenever he was riding, Solomon's riding along, as he rides along, he kind of looks over and 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 he pulls his camel up. He's like, "Let's stop him!" And, and he he looks. And as he looks over there, he sees a vineyard. This was a common sight in Israel. A vineyard. And when he looks at that vineyard, there's something that catches his eye. As he looks at it, he said, "That vineyard is in horrible shape. Somebody has not done." what they're supposed to be doing. Somebody has not done the work that was assigned to them. Because I know this field. I've, I've ridden by it for years, and somebody was assigned the task of taking care of this vineyard. And the problem is, as he looks at it, he immediately recognizes somebody has not accomplished their assigned task. And so as he looks at it, he's really come to the, coming to the place where he's talking about a work ethic. Somebody didn't work the way that they were supposed to. Tonight in our service, I'm going to finish this. So you're only going to get one half of what we're studying about the work ethic, a full sermon here, but we're going to add some parts to it tonight. But, but when we look at the Bible, uh, I believe that Christians ought to be the most honest, ethical, and hardest working people that there are in society. I really believe that we should be the people who are known as the most honest, the hardest working, and the most ethical workers. It ought to be, really should, it really should be that I have people calling me every week and saying, do you have any people in your church that need a job? Because I know that if I hire a Christian who's sold out to God, He's going to be somebody that I can trust, somebody that will be a self-starter, he'll be a hard worker, and he will be ethical in what he does. I believe that every Christian ought to have that characteristic and that testimony at work. And I believe Solomon backs that up as he looks at this. But he's talking here about a biblical work, work ethic. And in order to get what he's saying, we have to go inside his mind. And he's going to tell us three things that are going to make application to us. First of all, he looks at us and says, I want you to, to, to get my observation. And my observation here as I was writing by this field is you can tell immediately something is wrong. As he comes by this field, he probably knows a little bit of the history of it. And you and I would have to think a little bit uh, with an Old Testament mindset. This is a man who probably inherited his field. When you and I think of a field, we think of something that somebody has gone out and purchased. Now, remember your Old Testament, though. Because in the Old Testament, land was not bought and sold like it is now. You could buy and sell land. But the land was supposed to stay in the tribe and, if possible, in the family that God gave it to all the way back in Joshua and Judges and Ruth. That whole, remember this whole story there where the land was given to certain tribes and certain families and they were to keep those things. And so most likely, here's a, a, a man who inherited the land from his father and is probably a pretty good vineyard. Everything in the story indicates that there's a lot of potential in this thing, but somebody is not taking care of it. And so as he rides by, he instantly says, something isn't right here. I'm observing this vineyard, I know the man who owns it, and I'm going to describe him with two words or two phrases. Number one, he says, I'm going by the vineyard of the sluggard. Ooh, boy. 
That is not a kind way to talk about somebody. If I look at somebody and say, you sluggard, that is still in our culture not a compliment. Here's a man who's a sluggard. The equivalent term to that is one who lacks judgment or he lacks sense. The word sluggard is actually used 14 times in the book of Proverbs. It was something that Solomon regularly focused his attention on. In other words, he's trying to motivate people and say, you've got to learn to have a work ethic. You can't be a sluggard. We know what a sluggard would be. Most of us don't need a description. He's just kind of slow and moving. He's not self-motivated. He doesn't get things done. And so this guy is described as a slugger. He's an heir to the fields. And so this man has gotten the fields probably from his father, his grandfather, and now he owns them. And you can even go back to chapter 24, verse 27, where it says, prepare thy work outside and make it fit or make it ready for thyself in the field, and afterwards build thine house. And the whole principle was that, that you have to know that there are some things you have to do in order to be ready for the next thing that's going to happen. Uh, you don't put the cart before the horse. And in this case, there were things that needed to be done in order to have a crop at the end that had not be done, been done. He hadn't made his field, his vineyard, ready for the harvest in the future. If we were talking about some other kind of field, you would know intuitively what needs to be done. I'm not going to reap in, in November what I don't plant back in the fall or in the spring. Uh, I have some fields behind my house, and I enjoy watching them. Uh, they have a unique way of planting back there. They, they plant on that field behind me, and I watch them. It grows up. It's some kind of alfalfa or wheat or something, and they come in and harvest that. And then not long after that, fairly late in the year, they come in and they plant corn. And for the last several years, as they've planted corn in that field, every year I think, wow, they're planting that really late. I don't know if it'll be ready. But the last two weeks, I can look out, I can hear the, the combines running, they come in and these long, long fields, they come in and harvest the corn out. Here's somebody who has planned well. I mean, this guy has come in and he's gotten a crop off of this field, and then he's gotten a second crop off of this field. Do you know why here in the end of October he's out there and he can get the corn, the silage off of that field? because he planned it way in advance. He was, he was uh, trying to do it. Now, if I would look out at that field and, and the corn's only half grown, I would say, obviously, something isn't right. But I go by that field now, and I look at it, and I'm, I'm pretty impressed with what he does. But sometimes you can tell there's obviously something wrong. And as he looked at this particular vineyard, he, he said there's obviously something that is not right. This man has not gotten his vineyard ready. He has not done what needs to do in order to have the harvest that he would like to have at the end of the year. And right at the beginning of the little parable, he calls him a sluggard and a man who's lacking sense. So this is his observation. Here's what I'm seeing. Now, do you have that in your mind? Because you have to have it in your mind in order to come to his conclusion. We're going to go from his observation to his interpretation. And this is important because sometimes we look at things and we have the wrong response. He said, I'm going to interpret this. I'm going to take what I see, my observation, and I'm going to make an interpretation from it. And the interpretation here, one of the things that I want you to see is that you can learn from every circumstance or person. I love the verse in Proverbs that says, smite the scorner and the simple will beware. Smite the scorner and the simple will beware. Well, what do you mean by that? That means that if I see somebody get in trouble, I'm going to change my behavior. In other words, I'm watching this person, and so in watching this person and what happened to them, I don't want the same consequence, therefore I'm not going to behave the same way. How many of you had older siblings? And how many of you watched your older siblings get in trouble and said, I'm not going to get caught doing that? Now, not necessarily that you weren't going to do it, you're not going to get caught doing that. <laughs> you learn. See, uh, the smite the scorner 
and the symbol will be where? I don't want to get in trouble like he did, therefore I'm going to change my behavior. And actually, sometimes when they, you're the, the oldest child, you feel like your parents were a lot harder on you. Sometimes this the case is actually that, that you were the one who did it, and you got punished, and your, your younger siblings learned from that, and so they don't seem to get in as much trouble because you had the privilege of getting out of the trouble. But here is the same principle. He said, I have the opportunity to learn from everything that I observe. As you drive by, by this field of the vineyard, there are a couple of possible responses that you can have. You can simply applaud yourself. Say, man, I am so glad that I'm not like that guy. My vineyards, they're looking good. And I'm a man full of, of goodness. And I'm a man of industry, and I really have worked hard on my fields, and boy, look at me. And you pump yourself up. You've compared yourself to this guy, and you feel really good about it. Now, another way you could do it is you could simply condemn the man and go on. You could ride by on your camel. And you're riding by on your camel, you look over there and go, lazy slug over there, sloth. They don't have any sense. Oh, bum. And you just keep talking about him and how bad he is. And, and all of it may be true. And you condemn him and put him down and you, you harp on him and tell everybody you meet about him and how bad he is and how bad his vineyard is. What have you accomplished? Absolutely nothing. You're simply still trying to make yourself look a little bit better. But what happened here is that in interpreting this that he had seen, he actually allowed the sluggard to preach a silent sermon. Kind of a funny thing. Because here's a man who, who is slothful, and unknowingly, this slothful man is going to give a lecture on diligence. And he doesn't even know he's giving the lecture. But it takes the right kind of mindset to see it. And you and I need to learn that when we see somebody that's really messing up or doing something wrong, what we need to do is not just sit around and harp on them and complain and gripe and tell everybody about them. Perhaps you could learn something from them. Because Solomon said, I watched this as I was going by, and I saw this that was obviously falling apart, and I interpreted this. I came to a place where I learned something from it. What did he learn? His application to it was, I better be really diligent. I better really take some time and be diligent in my own work. I better develop a work ethic that's different from this man. Let me tell you a couple of things about this man, some things that you pull out of this as you go through. Um, I don't think that this man ever intended to let his field go. I don't think he ever intended for his vineyard to be in the disrepair that it was in. Because the words here are not a man who decides just to go off and do nothing. It says, yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. You know what that picture is? It isn't a man who has just simply thrown off his responsibilities and said, I don't really care. Um, I'm just going to go off and do whatever I'm going to do. That is not the picture at all. The picture is actually of a man who knows that he has some responsibilities. He knows that he owns this vineyard. He knows that there is work to do in this vineyard. He knows that the work is his responsibility and nobody else is going to do it. But he reasons in his mind, oh, man, ah, a little sleep would be really nice. You know, I think I'll take a nap today. And we'll do the work tomorrow, okay? And so he takes a nap, and then end of the day he goes out and he does a little bit of work, but boy, he's tired. Those naps make you really tired sometimes. And he goes home and hangs out with his wife and his kids and goes to sleep. The next day, I'll get up and I'll do my work. And, and the next day he gets up and his kids come in and say, Oh, Dad, can't we take a camel ride up on the mountain and have a picnic today? Uh, a little, you know, go up there and we'll, we'll kind of rest and just get, you, you deserve a break because, you know, you worked hard yesterday taking your nap. And um, so he says, well, you know, let's, let's have a little thing. And then the next day, he says, a little folding of the hands to rest. He works in the morning. And, Man, he's, this is hard work. I'm like sweating and it's hot out here. And, and I need a drink. And so he goes back and he gets a drink. And while he's getting a drink, he, he sits down on the lounge chair and picks his feet up. And before you know it, it's 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. 
And I'm like, well, I gotta get. So he gets out there and he works a little bit, and then it's dinner time, and, and then he's got church that night, and and the next day, same scenario. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands just to take a little more rest. It isn't that he doesn't know what he needs to do. It is that this man is have tr having trouble with his diligence in going out and doing it. He's having trouble motivating himself to accomplish it. He's not thinking of the end result. You know, when I look around in here, I, I was preparing this and I thought, you know, I, I think of so many people who are not like this. As a matter of fact, there can be people who are on the opposite extreme of this too, that all they ever do is work. But there are so many people in here that I appreciate who have the foresight to say, you know what, there's going to be a, a fall where I need a harvest. There's going to be a winter where I need food. I better prepare back in the spring. And they think ahead enough to know, I better put things aside because I know I'm going to need that in the winter. I'm going to be really hungry. If I don't in April go out there and plow my fields, if I don't go out there and trim the vineyards in this man's case, then I'm not going to have the grapes at the end of the year that I'm going to want in order to, to sell and have money to buy food. I better work. And here's a man who looks at this and, and he was enjoying pleasure when it was time to labor. Now, don't mistake the fact that there is a time for pleasure. There is a time to have fun. There's a time to sleep. There's a time to enjoy the family. But sometimes we get our priorities all mixed up. And the time to be in church is not the time to be out playing. The time to be working is not the time to be resting. And he was looking at this man and saying, he's gotten his priorities all mixed up. He's not diligent to accomplish the work that's been set before him. And so really we come to a, a couple, let's, let's put down three conclusions that we end up with from his application here. Number one, you cannot be indolent. Now what does indolent mean? I put it there in parentheses for you. It means avoiding exertion, and it's just the idea of lazy. Uh, indolence is not a person who doesn't know what they need to do, nor do they have, not have the ability to do it. They just aren't getting it done. And we know people like that. There are people who avoid exertion. Oh, every year. I have at least one teacher come in, and a child has had a book report due. And as those book reports come in, some teacher will come in and say, Not a problem. Well, what's your problem? Well, my problem is that I got this paper and I read it. And when I read this paper, it's obviously not this child's writing. I typed a phrase into it. I've taught the teachers how to do this, so students don't, don't try this. You can type the phrase into the internet and put it in Google, and it'll bring up the same paper that you stole it from. And so the teacher comes and says, what do I do with this student? I said, okay, well, you know, we're going to have to do something. So I call the student, and, and invariably, you know what happened? When I finally get to the bottom of it, here's a student. It says, it's just too much work. What do you mean it's too much work? Well, I only had one night to do it. <laughs> okay. When did you know about it? Well, I knew about it, you know, when we started school nine weeks ago, but I, I didn't do it. And I just had one night to do it, so I needed a little help. Well, here's somebody who didn't prioritize, wasn't diligent, and they were indolent in that they just really didn't want the exertion of having to read the book and write the report and research and do whatever they need. That's an indolent person. And, and he says, well, I stood here, and I, or I sat here, and I just looked. And I love in that passage how this busy King Solomon says that I stopped, and, and, it, it, and I looked. And I observed. I just took a minute to kind of put my chin on my hand and look at that field and come to some conclusions in my and I learned from this man that I cannot be a person who avoids exertion. This is the mindset that is invading our culture today. It's not a Christian mindset. You need to be willing to exert yourself. You can't be lazy and expect that God is going to bless. You have to be one who's willing to put yourself out and accomplish the things that God has put before you. What's number two? Well, number two, we're going to come to the place where we have to say, you can't procrastinate. 
Work overwhelms you. I missed in the first one. What happens on the first one is that, that when you are indolent, you're, you're just afraid of exertion. It's not, sometimes you're lazy, sometimes you just don't want to work hard, but you end up in poverty. What would happen with this man is that he would have crops that he needs to sell in order to buy food for his family. Then he comes to the fall and he doesn't have any food. And when he doesn't have any food, then he comes and he, he begs from other people. And he wants people to feel sorry for him and give him food. Well, that puts everybody in a really hard spot. Because here's a man, and possibly his family, he's not thought ahead enough to, to prepare for the winter, put things aside for the winter. And now his poverty is really a burden to him. It's something that's really hard for him, and it's a burden to everyone around him. And come to the second one, procrastination. Procrastination is simply putting off what you know you need to do until later. I have tried in my life. Now, everybody fails in these things, but I've tried to, to, in my list of work, do the hardest thing first, not the easiest thing. Some people will come up and say, all right, I'm going to get all the easiest things out of the way. You know, many times, just from a leadership perspective, what you need to do is go do the hard thing first. Get it done. And then you can do the easy things. Because what happens is you do the easy things and then you don't have the energy left to do the hard things. And we need to do the hard things. And procrastination is I put things off until later thinking that somehow they'll become easy. Is that usually the case? No, it's never the case. And it begins to then overwhelm you. So this guy goes out who owns the vineyard and he says, wow, it's a lot of work to do that. I mean, every one of those vines needs pruning. <laughs> That's a lot of work. I'm going to go back and think about it. Well, thinking about it isn't going to get it done. I mean, you're going to go hire somebody, go hire them, but don't procrastinate it. Do it. And people sometimes get to the place, and they'll come see a, a, a person, come see me, and they'll say, I'm just overwhelmed by everything that I have to do. And the problem isn't that you're overwhelmed by everything that you have to do. You're overwhelmed by everything that you didn't do when you were supposed to do it. And so finally this man comes and he's at the brink of disaster in the spring when he should be uh, trimming these things and he's crying out for help. I can't get all of this work done. And he hasn't been doing his work. He's procrastinating. Here's the third lesson that we're going to come away with from this. You cannot waste your opportunities. Notice I have after that work in your field. You know what a lot of people do? A lot of people look at their field and compare it to someone else's field and say, man, I wish I had that field. And so this man will look at his field and it's in disrepair. The stone wall's broken down and, and thistles and, and weeds are growing everywhere. And he looks over there and he sees this other field that's in great shape and he thinks, man, I wish I had that field. It isn't the field that's the problem. It's not the vineyard that's the problem. It's the man. If that man had that vineyard, it would soon look like his own. And what he needs to do is do his work in his vineyard. And often people are looking and saying, man, I wish I had that job. I wish I had that house. I wish I had that or that or that. God has given you this vineyard. Work in it. Make it look good. This is your vineyard. This is where God put you. Now build that stone wall. The rocks are not going to be lighter tomorrow than they are today. The vines are only going to grow more tomorrow than they've grown today. Now work in this vineyard. Do what needs to be done. And can't you sometimes identify with this vineyard owner as he walks out and after procrastination and his indolence, and after he's gotten to the place where he's wasted his opportunities day after day, now he's overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. Life is so hard and so unfair. And the truth is, it's his own work ethic that got him into trouble. It's the fact that he didn't plan ahead. It's the fact that he didn't work. Now, make no mistake about this. When you see somebody that's struggling, it is not always a work ethic problem. Please understand that. All the way through the Bible, we find that. If we would look at Job, and Job is poor, desolate, everybody's mad at him, and his friends are not even helping you. Look at him and say, Job, you just need a better work ethic. Job's problem was not his work ethic. His was that God was putting him through, through some things to teach him. And God will put people through things, and they'll go through times of, 
where they're poor and times where they struggle and difficulties, and it has nothing to do with work ethic, but many, many times what you will find is that you look at these three things and you'll find that that person could immensely help themselves and they've somehow talked themselves into life is so unfair, but the problem isn't that life is unfair and there's something wrong with the field, it's the, the owner of the vineyard. And if the owner of the vineyard could come to the place where he would recognize that he needs to accomplish the things that God has put before him, if he would put together in his own mind a biblical work ethic that I have the opportunity to work, I need to go out and do it. I need to get busy with what ought to be done. Not procrastinate, not sit around looking for pleasure, not enjoying pleasure when I should be working. Not again that you don't enjoy pleasure, but pleasure and work, uh, uh, you've got to uh, prioritize those. And you come to the place where you ask, am I assigned, accomplishing the assigned task? This happens in every area of our lives. It happens whether it's your job that you go to or whether it's our church. Because when we get a biblical work ethic, we find that things are incredibly easy to do. I've often mentioned the fact that I love when we have different activities. And underneath us, we have the cafeteria. Well, afterward, we get people helping put away the tables and the chairs, and bang, it's done. That's a biblical work ethic. Not everybody sitting back along the side and saying, oh, okay, Dave, hope you get all those tables put away. And hopefully before the evening service. No, let's all jump in and do it. You see, there is work to be done. And many times the reason the work is not being done is not because the work's too hard or the work's not really work that's been assigned to you. It's because you've not developed a, a timetable in your own mind to say, I'm going to be at Grow on Tuesday night, once a month. I'm going to be at church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday, because that's where I'm assigned. I'm going to witness to people because that's the job God has given me. And a biblical work ethic means that I come to the place where I recognize as I've trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I came to that place in my life where I allow all of my sin to be placed upon him and his righteousness to be placed on me. That moment when I trusted Christ as my Savior, I became his child and he assigned me some tasks and I need to accomplish those things. I don't pass them off to somebody else. I don't complain about them. I get them done. Those are opportunities God has given me. And as Solomon went by this field, he said, there's a whole lot we can learn from this. And in stopping and interpreting his observations, he said, I can make an application. And the application is that I've got to be diligent. I have got to put some effort into the things that God has assigned to me because those are my responsibilities. I have to accomplish the task that God has assigned to me personally. And when you don't do them, don't do them on time, and don't plan for those things, then they become overwhelming. You have to develop a biblical work ethic. And that's what Solomon is talking about. And so for you this morning, ask yourself the question, not just in the secular world, am I accomplishing my assigned task? But what about in your life spiritually? Are you accomplishing the assigned tasks? Maybe it's diligence on your part that is needed. There's not a problem with the vineyard. There's not a problem with the opportunity. There's a problem with the initiative. Is your diligence where it ought to be? Let's bow for prayer, please. As we do each week, I'm going to ask that you not look at me and not look at others for just a moment. We're going to play through a stanza of that song, Work for the Night is Coming. And maybe this morning you'd have to say there are some areas where God has really dealt with me about. Perhaps in your life as a worker, in a secular job, perhaps as a Christian in opportunities and responsibilities that God has given you. And I trust this morning that you will lay those things before the Lord and say, God, I'm going to correct those. As I look at that field of that vineyard, I see myself in some of those areas. And I trust this morning that you'll talk with God and say, Lord, you've convicted me. 
here's how we're going to respond. The altar is open here at the front. If you want to come and pray in the front pew or right here at the steps, welcome you to do that. In a moment, when we stand, perhaps you're not a believer. We'll have Todd and Sherry at the back of the auditorium. If you need to talk with somebody, would you step out? Just quietly make your way back there. We'd love to show you what the Bible teaches about the of salvation. Will you stand with me, please? Father in heaven, as we're standing before you, we recognize that your word has something for each of us. And as we take the time to read it, I pray that we'll make practical application. Thank you for the opportunities that are before us. Lord, help us not to lose those opportunities because of indolence or procrastination. But instead, help us to take advantage of those things. We pray in Jesus' name. Now, with our heads bowed, as we play through this, we can talk to you. And as always, we're going to finish in here, but if God's still dealing with you, maybe you have a question about something, please feel free to ask. We'd be happy to get you an answer to that question. And again, I appreciate the people who are hard workers and really uh, conscientiously do the things that God has assigned to them. Tonight in the service, we're going to take the same topic, but we're going to look at more Proverbs, just some list of things that talk about work and what Solomon was saying about that, and uh, put them in some categories. And so look forward to seeing you 6 o'clock this evening. I'd be glad to have you back for the service. Rob Brown, will you dismiss us in prayer, please? Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for our time together this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this message that you want to carry into our hearts. Look up, Lord, be more diligent, Lord, to your humble compassion that you have towards this world. And for all of us, we know the Lord, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would be with us.